Very good afternoon. Welcome to the House of Wellness. What a spectacular setting. You couldn't get a better day, could you? And you couldn't get better people to spend it with. Uh, Joe Stanley, Jackie Felgate, Dr Nick Carr. Good to see everyone again. Hi, good Dad. to see you, Dars. Oh, and look at this. We are in this beautiful fresh air surrounded by trees and plants and animals and birds. So, you know, I'm passionate about the power of the breath. Mm. So let's just take a moment to have a beautiful big deep breath in. <sighs> And out. How is that for calming the farm? Oh, <laughs> oh boy. It doesn't feel good. But I've got a little stat for you. Did you know that we actually breathe around 22 thousand times a day without even realising it. But if we consciously slow down and actually take a breath, Dr Nick, it can be really beneficial for our health. It's, it's true, Jack, and it's pretty incredible because every single breath we take affects our nervous system. And if we learn to control it well, it can actually help reduce things like stress, anxiety, it can make us more alert, and it can even give us that little immune boost. Lovely. And Nick, uh, breathing techniques and meditation are often closely linked and for good reason. As you just did off the top there, Joan, you take a deep breath, it's amazing how it calms your nervous system, you feel less stressed automatically and that's essentially what a lot of meditation and mindfulness techniques are trying to do is to just calm your nervous system down and reduce stress. Oh and the best thing is you can do it anytime. I love to do a lot of breath work when I'm doing the dishes. Strangely I need calming at that time and I like, I like it at the desk during the day or you know the best time I reckon when you're in traffic you know in peak hour mm. you're sitting at the lights you just <laughs> what a good use of time that is. You can take it anywhere and it's free. <laughs> I need to do more of that. <laughs> but when we actually slow down and we breathe and we're more mindful and we meditate, well, it can actually help migraine sufferers as well. Around about 5 million Australians suffer from migraines, 5 million and one, if you include me. <laughs> and uh, New York University has started a new trial with mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, showing really promising results. Nick never had a migraine, can't imagine what it's like, and clearly uh, you understand it better than most, but the close friends that I have, how debilitating it is and how mm. it can affect everything, your health, your relationships, and I'm not surprised that that study is starting to find those results. So again, when you think about meditation and the fact that it promotes better sleep, reduces stress, and there's no negative side effects, it's got to be a good place to start, doesn't it, as one of the things you could do to reduce migraines. Well, there are so many potential triggers for migraine stars, and you're right, stress is certainly one of them. And the great news is that the results from this trial show that after just six months, people are getting fewer migraines and less intense with this mindfulness therapy. Isn't that amazing? You know, migraines affect millions and it costs the economy billions, yet despite that, so little is known about its exact impact on sufferers and society. Well, it's hoped all of that is about to change. There's a new study spearheaded here in Melbourne. 20,000 homes are taking part and it's hoped it'll take the pain out of migraines. So, Dr Foster, what is a migraine? Medically, when we say migraine, we're actually referring to a very specific type of headache. Typically, migraines last between 4 to 72 hours. Pain, obviously, is something that's common for all the headache conditions, but a migraine pain tends to be a throbbing, pulsating pain. Often that intense pain is not the worst part of it. It's often the accompanying symptoms. People can have a lot of cognitive fogging during an attack. They're very sensitive to light, sound, smell, motion. They want to go lie in a dark, quiet room. They can't continue normal activity often if the migraine attack is peaking. And for approximately one in four people with migraine, they often have a warning symptom. They get a migraine aura. Um, and that's quite often a visual change that happens. Now, you're conducting some new research into this area, into the Australian population and migraines with a head study. Can you tell us a little bit about the aims of the study? Absolutely. So the head study is the Australian Headache Epidemiology Data Study. This study is looking to do a census of migraine in Australia. So we're asking people if you have headache or migraine, how often do you come to hospital, to your GP, what do you spend on medications, other aspects as well. I think things like informal care is really important. If you're a young mother and you've got young children and you have a bad migraine, you're going to need the assistance of families or friends or formal support. And that is just often not counted when we look at the burden of disease. And currently there's no cure for migraine. But is this something that you think could exist in the future and what would that look like? So when we talk about cure, what I often think we talk about medically is to remove the source of the problem. And at this stage, we don't do brain transplants. <laughs> <laughs> 
that medical technology is rapidly advancing, so I wouldn't in the future rule out it a way that we can manipulate the underlying migraine tendency. However, for now, we have made some really great breakthroughs scientifically in recent years in terms of managing migraine attacks. We're beginning to find effective medications. Um, most excitingly, new to the market are um, calcitonin gene-related peptide monoclonal antibodies. So it's a mouthful. It's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> it's a therapy that has been specifically designed to attack or um, work on a particular mechanism that drives migraine, I've seen it have a really tremendous change in, in how people's experience of migraine is. And you can find out more about the AHEAD study by heading to the Monash University website. Well, today is all about the power of the breath. And Dr Nick, is it true that we only absorb about 25% of the oxygen that we breathe in? Well, you're spot on, uh, Joe, because actually our exhaled breath still contains 15% oxygen. And I've got a couple of other fun lung facts for you. Mm. Yes. All right. uh, we exhale around half a litre of water every 24 hours, and the left lung is actually smaller than the right because it has to make room for the heart. Oh, so breathing obviously gets the big tick of health approval but what about sighing? I always thought if you sighed, you were sad or exasperated, but that's actually not the case. Not true, yeah. Researchers mm. at Stanford University have been doing some studies on a range of different breathing techniques, uh, Jack, and they've found that the exhaled breath, as Dr Nick was saying, as in a sigh, instant calming effect from that. <sighs> <laughs> so they're doing this thing called cyclical sighing and they found that what you have to do is exhale for about twice as long as you inhale and with a noisy grunt as well. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't do that. But, but, Sounds but, disturbing. But, but we know that all forms of controlled breathing are good for insomnia and anxiety, but they've shown that this cyclical sighing is actually best for stress reduction. Well, while we all know how to breathe, how many of us are using our breath to its best advantage? Well, our very own Breath of Fresh Air, Luke Hines, signed up for a masterclass in oxygen therapy with one of the world's best. If you've ever felt stressed and that anxiety kicks in, no doubt someone's instructed you to simply take a deep breath. Now, it's fantastic advice because negative emotions can have an effect on our health, both mentally and physically. That's why developing certain breathing techniques can be a game changer when it comes to managing stress, anxiety, even insomnia. It has never been more important to take notice of how we breathe. All right, what I'd like to work on with you today, yeah. if you don't mind, of course. is I, like many, yeah. do experience stress and anxiety. So many people are walking around with it. Yeah. I think it'd be great to work with you on some techniques that people can implement anywhere, anytime. Yeah. I love it. Um, how about we test your breath? OK. Yeah. Have you got a timer on there? Yep. I want you to do it at home. It's really simple. So we just start a timer, but the moment we start it yep. is the moment we begin exhaling. So okay. we are actually going to test your breathing how long ability do you want? and your lung capacity. I'm looking for a minute. OK. So I'll press okay. start. It'll give me a minute. Yeah. You do three big breaths. Yep. And on the last one, you take a breath in and you turn to breathe out as slow as you can. Just like you're breathing through a little When straw, do I press play? The moment the exhale begins. Okay. Johannes, is there a right or wrong way to breathe? Yes and no. Yes and no. You know, the most interesting thing about breathing, perhaps, is that no one ever teaches us how to do it. And that's where someone like myself comes in, right? So I'm actually a breathing instructor. And that is a big rabbit hole to open up because there are many, many different ways of breathing, many different techniques. And again, People generally don't have much insight or experience with how you can apply your breath to different situations in life. Okay, here we go. Deep breath in. Start the timer. And very slow breath out. Try and control your exhale as much as you can. So you're just breathing really slow, really slow. And try and relax. It's all about letting the tension wash away and keeping a steady flow of air. When we're walking around on a day-to-day -day basis, yeah. do you think the way that we breathe in those moments is conducive to optimal health? Without a doubt. Physical and mental. And this is where I think it gets interesting, is, is your brain actually spies on your breathing on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. And if your breathe is only slightly out of tune, your brain's going to follow that, and your body is going to follow that. And anxiety is so closely related to the way that we breathe, right? As well as our physical health. I mean. We're just talking about oxygen, right? 
And that's like the first principle. It's where everything begins. So when we get our breath better, our life gets better. And when you get to a point where it starts to build a bit of pressure, you can go through your mouth and just pretend that you're breathing through a straw. And then it goes as little air as possible. But continue to go and breathe and breathe and breathe. So these techniques can be implemented into all elements of our life, no equipment necessary, anywhere, anytime. What type of change over what period of time does it take for someone to get the benefits of breath work? I think the beauty of it is it can provide instant change. And that's what they found. It was perhaps one of those key differences between well, just meditation and conscious breathing exercise. It does provide instant stress relief. And the timer stops the moment you don't have any air left, right? So we're still breathing out, we're still breathing out. If I were to hold a feather under your nose, it would move, but almost not at all. The thing is, as human beings, we are actually meant to breathe at a certain rhythm. Now, it is different person to person, but the moment you increase that rhythm, you essentially increase the amount of energy that your body takes on, and you increase the amount of tension that your body holds, and you actually decrease the amount of oxygen that can flow into your brain. So this is where it gets slightly complicated, but it doesn't have to be. The more you breathe, the less you oxygenate. And so the key actually lies in breathing less. And when we breathe too fast, the brain gets too reactive and the body gets tense and we sort of tighten up and we sometimes hold our breath. And, and what we're looking for is a slow, smooth, low rhythm of breathing that can just restore balance so quickly. All right, so if what I'm hearing is correct, mm -hmm. it's quality, not quantity. So when it comes to quality, yeah. I want you to describe yeah. the perfect breath for me. Beautiful. I go low, slow, and less. So low being, we're looking to breathe using our diaphragm. Yeah, so just a very so simple diaphragm one. right here. Diaphragmatic breath, it's a beautiful sheet of muscle that's actually sometimes overlooked, but it might be one of the most important muscles in the body. It's what's holding you upright right now. Ooh, thanks, Doctor. It's moving all your organs, yeah. and it's massaging everything in there, and it's really creating this mobility for you to, I think about breathing a big free breath is living yeah. a big free life. Right? Oh, I love that. So opening up your diaphragm just creates a bit of space for your body to actually do its thing. So yeah, yeah. You, you got it already right there. One little trick I say to people is binky in the belly button, Yep. Thumb in the sternum. Yep. And what you notice is when you're slumped. Oh. But then when you stretch that out, yeah. you see how you naturally course correct? Yes. A couple times a day, breathing low. Okay. Next up, breathing slow. Okay. okay. Simplest way to do this is to make sure that you're breathing through your nose. And this is probably the one thing everybody can take on is please, 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 as much as you can breathe through your nose. That's what we're designed for as human beings. And when we don't, when we breathe through the mouth, our airways close. And oh, the, the, the side effects are like insane. It goes down so many different angles, you'd be amazed. So mouth closed, gently in through the nose, low breath, slow breath, so nice and gentle. And then the idea is that you breathe less. So over the space of a minute, we're looking to breathe about 10 breaths. And I'll tell you, the pattern on average for people is more like 20. Keep going, keep going. Start switching to the mouth when it gets hard, yeah. <laughs> all the way, 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 and stop. <laughs> 55 seconds. Close. So the goal is to get to a minute? Mm hmm And what's a minute say? Two minutes. Two minutes? Training. <sighs> and that's how it's done. <laughs> so this is the thing. Your breathing is actually super malleable. Yeah. It's plastic in its nature. I started both to panic. in the brain and in the lungs. I started to panic. And it will show you those feelings as well. <laughs> yeah. But that was pretty good, I can yeah, say. Okay. That was pretty good. So That's that gives done. me a bit of an indication of where we're at yep. and how we can improve. Okay. Bada yep. bim, bada boom. Johannes is absolutely brilliant. He has got so much wisdom when it comes to breathing techniques. We're going to be bringing you part two and part three of that interview in the coming weeks. So stay tuned for that. We'll be back right after the break. Bit of a personal question, Dars. What colour oh, undies sure. do you wear? <laughs> so I could show you, Jack, but that would be a I'll bit pass. weird. Uh, I'm not sure, actually. No, I think, no. uh, whatever Beck puts that. 
<laughs> well, someone always told me you should wear black undies. Shouldn't you? It's probably a good idea, but not this week, because this week is Red Undies Week, which helps raise awareness for kidney disease. Which is a great cause, and unfortunately, it's a lot more common kidney disease than people think. Jack, did you know 50 Australians die every day with a kidney-related illness? Yeah, just terrible. And those most at risk aged over 50, high blood pressure, obesity and smokers. Yeah, and the key to often improving health is to avoid getting those ailments in the first place. Big fan of preventative health and also education and awareness, including in one of the biggest killers in Australia, that's stroke. Hi, and welcome to Medicine Past, Present and Future. My name's Dr Nick, and I'm the past. And my name's Dr Isabel, and I'm the future. And together, we're, we're the, the present. present. Now, Dr Nick, spot diagnosis. Oh, another challenge. So I was in country Victoria recently, and walking around in the yard was a chicken. It looked a little bit like this. <laughs> what do you think was going on? Well, it obviously had a big night out and maybe feeling a bit seedy. Oh, not quite. <laughs> All right, what about chicken interpretive dance? Oh, come on, Dr Nick, this is a medical segment. <laughs> All right, I, actually, I think I know. Maybe the chicken had had a stroke. Correct. Now, Dr Nick, what is a stroke? A stroke occurs when the blood supply to part of the brain is cut off, either through hemorrhage or ischemia. <laughs> Dr Isabel, you're the junior doctor. What does that actually mean? Well, it sounds a bit technical, Dr Nick, but it's actually pretty simple. Hemorrhage means bleeding and ischemia means blockage. And like a heart attack, a stroke comes on really quickly, which is why it's sometimes called a brain attack. And in ancient Greece, it was actually called apoplexy, which means to be struck down or incapacitated. So, Dr Nick, could they do anything for these victims of apoplexy? Uh, well, not back then, um, but by the 1800s, doctors had started operating on the clogged up blood vessels in the neck, and surgeons still do that today. It's called a carotid endarterectomy. Now, these days we focus more on prevention, things like making sure your blood pressure is in a healthy range, you've got healthy cholesterol levels, and making sure your diabetes is well controlled. And actually, Dr Isabel, can we add to that Stop smoking! <laughs> it's one of the most important things you can do for your health generally, as well as reducing your risk of stroke. Now, back to the chicken. The chicken? Yes. Why did we both diagnose stroke in the chicken? And have you heard of the mnemonic FAST, Doctor? Ah, yes, FAST. The things we need to think about and act fast, because they might indicate that someone's having a stroke. So the F is for facial droop, A for arm weakness, S, slurred speech, and then the T is for timing is everything, so call triple zero fast. Because early intervention saves lives. Now, neither of us are vets, but the chicken having its head off to one side and one wing stuck out was enough for both of us to think about strokes. However, I didn't hear any slurred clucking, Dr Nick. <laughs> I, I actually think that the mnemonic for the chicken shouldn't be fast, but fast. Fast, like F-A-S-C? Yeah fry and serve with chips. Ooh, delicious. <laughs> Great advice there, Dr Nick, alongside your daughter, Isabel, on how we can prevent one of the number one killers in this country. Now, Dr Nick, I know that you are a huge advocate of giving up smoking, and so you must be really thrilled about the recent vaping bans. Yeah, yeah this is huge news, Joe, because they haven't set a date yet, but pretty soon the only way you'll get a nicotine vape is on a prescription from your pharmacist. Now, you know, we know that vaping can help people who smoke give up that revolting tobacco, but there's been this massive rise in vaping amongst kids, and so anything that stops them getting those health risks of nicotine addiction, lung damage, got to be good. Oh, look, as a parent of a teen, I am absolutely thrilled because vaping is everywhere. <sighs> One in 16 teenagers have vaped. And e-cigarettes advertising is all over TikTok, which is, you know, the number one social media platform for teenagers. And obviously, that advertising puts vaping in a really appealing light. Uh, well, you're absolutely right, Joe. And Curtin University are completely across this because their research has shown that 98% of all of the TikToks around e-cigarettes show them in a positive light. And these, these TikToks are made by young kids for kids, so they're so influential. Oh, look, it really emphasises too for me that we need better legislation, policies around advertising on social media, don't you think? I don't know where you're going with this, the new tax on cigarettes. How good is this, the <laughs> yeah. tax on cigarettes? This really made my day. So 5% per year for three years, first increase in September. Every increase in cigarette price reduces use. Got to be good.
Well, give me some big, deep breaths with some fresh air any day, which, of course, is one of the key features of yoga. And I went along to a special session to check in on my breath and chakras. Nikki, explain to us the origin of chakras. Uh, India is where the chakra system was originally designed or, or written about um, many, many moons ago. Um, it is an energy system that runs up the spine, basically. So we have seven chakras starting at the coccyx and ending at the top of the head. They're basically representing parts of the whole of us and these energy centres are allowing you to kind of tune yourself in a way. And tell me about the colours of the chakra. What significance do they have? So they represent probably the energy of that chakra. So you can notice that it goes from a real dense kind of colour all the way up and starts to get lighter and lighter. It's the same energetically. So the way that we are connected to the ground is through the lower part of our, our body. And as we move up, we start to open up spiritually, mentally, intuitively, as we get up to the higher chakras. So there are seven chakras. Can you explain to us where they are, their colours and their connection with who we are? Sure. So the base chakra is red and that is uh, basically our earth bounding chakra. The second one is our, our sacral chakra. So it's about our creativity and that is orange. Yeah, it's just about two inches below the belly button. Mm -hmm. And then the next one is a few inches above. So that's the solar plexus. We often feel a little tightness here. So this is our self-esteem and the way that we maybe present ourselves and uh, how courageous we are. And then the heart chakra is green and that is our connection through love and compassion. And then the throat chakra is blue, and this is our way that we communicate. So our language and also how we, how clear we are with how we communicate in the world. And, uh, and then there's Ajna, which is our third eye chakra, and that is indigo. So it's like a purple color. And this is really our, our intuition, the part of us that um, connects on a deeper level and then working towards our spiritual self, which is the crown chakra. And that is usually um, a kind of like a, a violet colour or a white colour. So let's do the base chakra. So start by placing your feet on the floor and then just slowly lower yourself down. Yoga is very much based on the chakra system. Not always, but generally you'll sequence it towards that. So you'll start in a warm up at the beginning where you're grounding down, you're placing your feet on the floor. You're really just getting more and more connected to the ground because often you can come into a yoga class and be thinking about work, thinking about other things, thinking about your life stresses. And then you'll start to build a bit of fire. So as it moves up the chakra system, you'll start to move the body a little bit more fluidly and it creates a sense a flow of energy. Feel that? Yeah. Sure. Yep. Nice deep <laughs> breath in and then exhale out. So I hear people talk about being connected with their chakras or having their chakras aligned. What does that mean? So each chakra is representing a part of us. So that, say for example, the heart chakra. If you are feeling, you know, really lost in life and not connected and unable to share yourself in a loving and compassionate kind of way, you might think that there's something going on energetically there that is not aligned. Say, for example, you break up with someone, that's going to affect your heart chakra for sure. It's also probably going to affect the way that you speak um, and also the solar plexus, the way that you are kind of presenting yourself to the world and how courageous you are. So I would probably suggest having a look at that and, and talking to it in a sense that how do I find balance again within myself like that? How do you feel? I feel great. <laughs> so what is the ultimate goal in engaging with our chakras? I think more than anything is just so you can know yourself. I think that the world that we live in is really feeding this idea that we have to be like someone else a lot of the time, whether it's through social media or whether that's through um, media itself. We get quite confused about who we are. So the more we can be quite simple and grounded and connected to how that we feel. Uh, this just empowers us to present ourselves to everything in life and actually manifest and create things in a really clear way. So it's just like yoga, it's reconnecting you to yourself.
Dr Nick, it is peak flu season at the moment and already cases are higher than this time last year and that's got the experts really worried. Yeah, because flu season normally runs sort of May to October with a peak so July, August, but 2023 so far turning out a bit different. Mm, there have been 32,000 cases so far. That's five times higher than last year, which I guess brings me now to the flu jab. And should kids under five get them? Yeah, well, absolutely right, mm. Jack. So um, six months to five years are at high risk, as are the elderly, but also, funnily enough, pregnant women. So getting a jab during pregnancy protects her and the newborn baby. So if you haven't had your flu shot yet, Get on and do it. Well, Dr Nick, we are all about keeping our families happy and healthy and your family is working to do just that. Yes, well, as we saw earlier, I often appear on the show with my doctor daughter, Isabel. That's right. Well, she's now popped down to the Alfred Hospital for a chat with her aunt, my sister-in-law, about her work with a life-saving registry. So, Penny, you've been managing Spleen Australia since I was a little kid. In fact, I was last here in 2007 doing high school work experience. But I don't think we've ever spoken about how it started. So can you tell me a little bit about establishing the Spleen Registry? My boss, Dr Dennis Spellman, was looking after a 22-year-old young woman in intensive care who had lost her spleen when she was 15, she'd had it removed for a blood disorder and she didn't know her risk of sepsis. So she was in intensive care on a ventilator and not looking like she was going to survive. And the dad said to my boss, could this have been prevented? Dennis looked at the dad and said, yes. It's highly likely it could have been prevented if she had have known and you about the signs and symptoms of a bacterial infection. We may not talk about it as much as other organs, but the humble spleen plays a key role in helping our bodies fight bacteria. Which means if your spleen has been damaged or removed, it's essential to stay informed on how to reduce your health risks. Hello, Spleen Australia, Sharon speaking. So the registry is really about supporting the patient, the GP, and helping them reduce the risks of severe infections. And that's by education, and that's us, the team in the office, we educate the patients and their relatives and as many people as possible. And then there's vaccines. So there's three major groups of bacterial infections that we like to protect the patients against, pneumococcal, meningococcal, haemophilus influenzae. So we make sure that the patients are up to date with those vaccines and now they're free. A few years ago, they were up to $600 for the cost of all of those vaccines. So recently there was a very high profile case with actress and model Charlby Dean from Triangle of Sadness. Now she has a history of splenectomy. She became quite severely unwell quite quickly and unfortunately passed away. Can you tell us what happened in that case? From my reading, Charlby Dean had a dog and she didn't have a spleen. And she got licked or bitten by her dog and probably didn't know about her risk of sepsis from a dog bite. And got an overwhelming post-splenectomy sepsis. If you get a bite, you monitor it, put a bar around the bite, and if it gets red and inflamed, you hop it to the GP and get a course of antibiotics. Melbourne engineer Fiona Stevenson has been on the spleen registry since 2004, when she received an emergency splenectomy whilst pregnant with her second child. I got sick at home, hadn't been feeling that well for a couple of days, um, and I ended up collapsing at home. Um, ambulance took me to hospital and they did a scan and found a mass of internal bleeding um, and they didn't know what it was um, so they opened me up and found that my spleen had ruptured. So I didn't have a car accident, none of the usual things, it just, just sort of happened. So you were 26 weeks pregnant, you've just had a splenectomy, what happens next? Were you able just to go home? Um, it wasn't quite that easy. I was pretty sick for a long time. Um, I also, my pancreas was damaged as well, so um, I had a second surgery to repair that. And then I was sort of in and out of hospital for the rest of the pregnancy. Although I did go full term and I delivered naturally and I had a very fat, healthy baby boy. <laughs> it's fantastic to hear. Yeah. What are some of the challenges of living without a spleen? Um, it's really just making sure that um, when you get sick, I feel like really understanding that if you do get sick, you can get sick really quickly um, and it can spiral out of control quickly, particularly in terms of bacterial infection. So just being really mindful. If I travel, I've always got um, uh, antibiotic supply with me and I always let GPs and doctors know that I don't have a spleen. 
do you feel being on the registry has helped reduce your risk of contracting a bacterial infection? Uh, without a doubt. Um, I, I, even when I first came out from having a splenectomy, me, there was so much going on I didn't really know. But the spleen registry have sort of taken me on a journey in terms of my own education and my own management, yeah. So what symptoms of a bacterial infection should someone who's had a splenectomy be looking out for? So there's a few, and it, we say one or a few of these or all of these. Vomiting, diarrhoea, shivers, shakes, sweats, not making sense, just feeling awful and can't get warm. People tell us that they just have to jump in the bed and get lots of doonas on the top of them. They're really big red flags that they must go and be checked out by a GP. Well, the footy season is in full swing, which of course we love, Das, but with it come on-field collisions, which is very much in the headlines, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, no doubt, Joe. around the world, head issues in sport has become the biggest challenge facing codes. And on the local front here in Australia, the AFL have announced a $25 million study in to try to further understand the long-term effects of concussion. Well, it's a really big concern, isn't it? Not just in professional sport, but community sport as well. And in actual fact, concussions is the biggest cause of hospitalisation in community community sport and very sadly we've even seen some recent deaths. And Joe, alarmingly the biggest or in fact two thirds of concussions happen in players that are 12 to 19 years of age so those of us that are parents like you and I that have got kids playing it does make you think a little bit about it doesn't it? Oh absolutely and I don't know why but I have volunteered as the first aid <laughs> officer for my daughter's <laughs> under 14 footy team. It is so terrifying. We've had some concussions already and you know it's made me really interested in this local Victorian footy club, the Trentham Saints, who have actually made wearing helmets compulsory for under 11s and under 14s. Now, helmets don't prevent concussion, but they can protect against more serious head injuries. Yeah, and I've seen a bit of this as well, Joe, where some clubs make it compulsory for helmets to be worn. The research is a bit interesting on this because there is a thought that actually concussions, as you said, aren't prevented by helmet use. And the counter argument is that perhaps you encourage kids to be a little more reckless than they otherwise would be and don't learn how to protect themselves well. So we're going to watch that space, Joe, with a lot of interest. Absolutely. So from footy that is played with an oblong ball on an oval to footy that's played with a round ball on a square pitch. That's called soccer, Joe, well, here in Australia. What? Without wanting to... <laughs> I don't want to start a war with anyone. No, no, whatever you call it. It's called soccer. Whatever you call it. <laughs> The FIFA Women's World Cup is almost on our shores and we're very excited. More after this. It's cold, it's raining, and it's getting dark early. It's the perfect time to seek refuge inside during winter. But this can mean a whole new set of new triggers to cause those familiar and frustrating symptoms. Rule, what causes allergies? Allergies are typically nothing but an overreaction of one's immune system when the body comes in contact with something called as an allergen or a trigger. When you take in or inhale, or when the allergen comes in contact with the skin, it actually starts a biochemical or releases a biochemical histamine. What are some of the symptoms of allergies? Could be sneezing, runny nose, itchy throat, watery eyes. 20% of the Australian population actually suffers from allergic rhinitis or symptoms of allergies. But the alarming fact is 35% of them are letting their symptoms go untreated. I'm familiar with pollen as an allergen, but what are some other allergens that cause these symptoms? Pollen or spring pollen is typically associated as hay fever alone, but there's something also called as the dust allergens or indoor air allergens. The dust mites usually flourish in the coastal humid areas, and uh, around 85% of the population resides within 50 k's of the coast, and therefore the dust and the dust allergy is really prevalent. When you try and dust stuff and you know clean your house, the house dust mites or the dust really stirs up. It actually exacerbates the symptoms of indoor air allergen. But there is relief and there are second generation antihistamines which latch onto the cells and then sort of mitigate the symptoms of allergic rhinitis caused by house dust. So what I'm hearing you saying is I can do less housework from now on. <laughs> <laughs> Telfast 60 milligram provides fast, non-drowsy, 12 hour relief from dust allergies. 
Joe, you, me, the entire country, we've all gone footy mad. Soccer, that is, as we count down to the 2023 FIFA Women's World Cup. I cannot wait, Jack. It kicks off on July 20 with Australia and New Zealand sharing hosting duties. It's the first time a senior FIFA event has been held in either country. 32 teams will go head to head in a dazzling sporting display, but it's also a really important moment for inclusivity in sport, particularly for our female stars of the future. I think it's going to change perceptions here in this country around women's sport. I don't think we're going to hear the term, you know, no one's watching or no one's paying um, after this Women's World Cup. Australia is a great sporting nation and sport is something that unites the country and brings us all together. I think attitudes need to shift and thinking around women's sport and the, the return on investment for women's sport, that's going to change after this. For us to be able to, you know, truly be an inclusive sport, we need to think about how we reshape the sport for women and girls and that's really our Legacy 23 plan, what it's about. And then thinking about the many, many levers we need to pull to get there and, you know, the Matildas are a very big part of that for us. I mean, filling stadiums, we're sitting here today, it's highly likely that Matildas' allocations for their matches will go in a matter of minutes. The work we've done with the soccer and Matildas. We have pay equity. We delivered that in 2019. It was a real signal to women and girls that we are a sport right from grassroots. And if you're going to put your child in our sport, we're going to treat them equal. And for us, it's about unpacking gender equity at all parts of the game. Nature is truly beautiful, so it will come as no surprise that ingredients from nature are also going to make us feel and look even more beautiful. The Nude by Nature Awaken Lengthening Mascara is a 100% natural lengthening mascara with no plastic or polyester fibres that have no business being near those beautiful eyes. Many of you at home probably don't realise, but it's these nasties that sneak their way into other mascaras which create that length. This mascara instead has a plant-based coating which instantly lengthens and separates lashes for an eye-opening lift. Plus, it's enriched with botanical oils that help soften and condition lashes. So with mascara, the brush does half the work and the application, and then the rest of it is really down to the formula. So if you're wanting to lift the lash, you can just go in from the root of the lash and simply, in upwards motions, put the wand and it will give you that beautiful lift. So the great thing about this brush in particular, especially with your bottom lashes, it really gets in there and separates each lash so it therefore appears longer. If you're wanting to elongate the eyes, you can turn it to the side, simply apply it like this, and you'll get that fan lashed elongated look. For me, the most important thing when selecting a mascara is that it's non-irritating and gentle on your eyes. The Awaken Lengthening Mascara is also vegan and animal cruelty free. Whether you're just starting out with your makeup journey or you're someone like me that has lots of experience in makeup, it goes without saying that mascara is our holy grail product. So it's genius to me that now there is a product available that is 100% natural. And I mean, who else are we going to trust other than Mother Nature herself? Now, Darcy, I don't know if this is a little too personal, and I know it's not the top of your importance list. <laughs> I'm worried. No, well, I've been noticing a little bit of salt and pepper creeping in with you there on your head. Thanks for the feedback, Joe. <laughs> Feedback's a gift. Um, my uh, dad, Big D, was a bit of a silver fox early on, so I'm not, I'm not uncomfortable with a few greys. You know what? I love a bit of salt and pepper <laughs> on a guy. And do you know what else I love? I love that women more and more are accepting their grey hair and really embracing it, because why not? I think it looks gorgeous. Well, it's just a sign we're getting older, isn't it, Joe? which I'm comfortable with. The interesting part is, up until recently, we've had no idea what causes grey hair. But science has finally got an explanation. Apparently what happens is the stem cells that are responsible for colour basically build up and get trapped and literally can't do their job anymore. So the colour just fades away. Joe, where there's an explanation, pretty soon a cure follows, and researchers in the US have found a way to unblock stem cells in mice that could lead to the end of grey hairs for humans as well. 
Well, whether you choose to rock the silver or cover it up with 50 shades of whatever you like, there is a grey-looking mineral that we all need more of. Here's Heinze and Zoe to tell us more. I don't like to play favourites when it comes to nutrients, Zoe, <laughs> but I've got to say zinc is definitely up there. It is big in the health game. And we happen to be using ingredients that will give us a boost of zinc, Lukey. But not from the foods that you would typically think. Some rich food sources of zinc include meat, fish and seafood, but I'm actually using chickpeas today for my zinc hit, appearing in my loaded avos. A vegetarian dream. In fact, a dream dish for everyone. And pepitas is where you'll find the zinc in my superfood fruit ball recipe. Oh, they sound delicious, but interestingly, zinc is what's referred to as an essential mineral, particularly when we're talking about immune health. That's because of its dual roles in helping support us through the common cold or flu. First off, it's an antioxidant, which helps reduce free radicals formed within the body. It also helps support immune system health when common colds or flus happen. It does happen, Heinze, all year round, not just at this time of year when there's more wintry germs around. And thank goodness, zinc doesn't have to do all the heavy lifting. Other nutrients we can look to for maintaining a healthy immune system all year round include vitamin A and vitamin C. As well as in food, all these nutrients can be found in supplement form. Sounds good to me, Zoe, but I tell you what, I have got my eyes on those delicious balls. How many can I have? You can have as many as you want because they're healthy. I'm going to see how many I can fit in my mouth all at once. Get Nourished is brought to you by Bioceutical Zinc Sustain with vitamins A and C to support and maintain a healthy immune system all year round. Speak to your pharmacist for specially formulated relief. Well, before the break, we saw a potential breakthrough in preventing grey hair, Joe, which feels pretty timely for me. <laughs> yes, or perhaps we're choosing not to cover up our greys at all, which is exactly what the latest and oldest ever Vogue cover model epitomises. Oh, this is stunning. She's beautiful. Apo Wang Odd has just graced the cover of Vogue Philippines. And get this, 106 years old. Stunning. And the gorgeous centenarian is actually the oldest Filipino traditional Kalinga tattoo artist, which means hand-tapping tattoos with bamboo and coal. Kalinga tattoos are used to signify strength and power and beauty, and they're passed down through blood relatives. Jo, I remember when we were in Hawaii a couple of years <laughs> back, you were contemplating oh. something similar on the tattoo front or not? Look, we did interview a similar <laughs> tattoo artist, and I don't know, conveniently ran out of time for myself <laughs> to get a tattoo that day. Speaking of running out of time, that is all we've got time for today on the House of Wellness. Make sure you check out myself and Gerald Quigley on House of Wellness Radio every Sunday. And you can check out the latest wellness lift out, which has a focus on men's health. Thanks as always to our great friends at Chemist Warehouse. We'll see you next week.